lo que vinimos a medir es eh, principalmente la capacidad de este tranque. Para eso eh, nosotros medimos el perímetro, que también nos podemos apoyar con imágenes satelitales para calcularlo, y eh, la altura o la profundidad del mismo. Eh, también debemos medir el caudal de entrada, es decir, desde donde se alimenta este tranque del canal principal y el caudal de salida que vendría a ser como ya lo que alimenta a los huertos. Eh, determinamos principalmente cuánta agua están regando actualmente a través del riego por inundación. Más que nada yo creo que en este caso es muy importante eh, la entrevista, la información que nos puede proporcionar el agricultor y el administrador de riego. Creo que eso es lo más valioso que, que podemos sacar con esta visita. Esta primera medición es relevante eh, porque finalmente es nuestro punto de partida. O sea, con esto nosotros sabemos cuánta agua se está utilizando el día de hoy y podemos proyectar cuánta agua podríamos eficientizar eh, a través del método de riego técnico. Lo volveremos a medir cuando ya esté instalado el sistema tecnificado de riego y lo que esperamos ver es efectivamente una diferencia entre lo que están regando actualmente y lo que estarían regando. Water is the fuel of agriculture. Everything we do in agriculture is driven by water. Technologies to farmers, but what you don't see, don't see is a solution like ours that puts a value on the effort that a farmer can make. If our farmers are more efficient in using water, they get paid for that, and we're the first company in the world that is paying farmers for saving water.
Great. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Good morning or good evening, uh, depending where you're joining us today. Uh, I'm Carmen Guerrero Sotelo. I'm the business manager of Quilimo in Mexico. And joining us today is Sara Hoverstan. We are going to be talking about uh, water stewardship and climate action. And uh, before we start with this uh, conversation, I'd like to uh, give you a little briefing about who we are at Kilimo. And Lucia, if you can uh, share your screen. Or well, I, I'm going to say you uh, without the, the slides. Well, at, at Kilimo, we are a climate tech startup that is uh, focused on uh, water stewardship solutions in agriculture using technology to address the uh, water scarcity exacerbated by climate change. And what we do in our daily ba basis is to connect um, corporations and stakeholders that are investing in water security with local farmers to conserve uh, water in the most water stress basins across Latin America. And uh, now uh, I would like to hand it over to uh, Sarah. Sarah, how are you today? I'm great, Carmen, good morning. Good morning where I am. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yes, yes. I think we, we have people from all over the, the world, I hope. And uh, Sarah, thank you very much for being today with us. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to gain a lot of uh, value from your insights, uh, from your knowledge, your experience. And Sarah, can you please uh, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about who is BEF? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Um, again, I am Sarah. I am the Senior Director of the Business for Water Stewardship Program at the Bonneville Environmental Foundation. That is a big nonprofit mouthful of things. Um, but BEF for short, we are a nonprofit that is based in the Pacific Northwest. And we are really focused on advancing on the Pacific Northwest, excuse me, of the United States. Um, and we are focused on advancing solutions that address climate challenges by restoring freshwater ecosystems and catalyzing renewable energy future for all. The, the program which I represent and oversee specifically the BWS program is now one of the leading entities that's working with companies to help them participate in and fund water resilience solutions that address our shared water challenges to ultimately benefit people, communities, and nature. Um, right. Primarily, we work on behalf of corporate partners to vet and develop and fund water projects. Um, started really uh, across North America, but increasingly internationally now. And um, really, our, our team takes a lot of pride in helping to improve corporate water stewardship strategies, understanding the priority target basins, and developing partnerships with partners, investing in water projects, and then ultimately helping to impact various uh, watersheds across the world. Uh, I'll say that we have three primary pillars of work in, in the work that we do. The one is thought and movement leadership. And this is really how are we getting more companies involved in water stewardship and smarter water policies? How are we shaping the direction of the industry? And how are we kind of catalyzing collective action uh, in the space where we work? The water stewardship um, strategy guidance, and then the third one being um, the water project scoping, development, funding, and management. Um, and just to close out you know, the, the who we are, since 2009, um, really an increasingly, like very recently, but the number since 2009 is BF has helped facilitate over $46 million in funding for um, yeah. over 450 water projects across North America and select international local locations uh, that have collectively restored 59 billion gallons of water to date. Um, I'm thrilled to be here to talk about these uh, issues today and look forward to getting into it. Yeah, I bet you you should feel very proud, Sarah, and BEF is a, yeah, a great organization. And we have the pleasure to, to work with you. 
And Sara, so let's dive in, in in the conversation. And I think we should start with the basics because uh, many times we think that all the people know uh, what we're talking about and these uh, fancy words to say something. So uh, can we start um, asking you what is water corporate water stewardship? Yeah, thanks, Herman. And I appreciate us laying out the context here, um, especially in any line of work where you work in your space and you think everyone understands what you're talking about, um, <laughs> which isn't always the case, right? So uh, when when we say, when we talk about corporate water stewardship, um, this this is what we're talking about. So more and more global companies are looking to assess and reduce their water risks uh, related, business risks related to water. Um, and it's common now that many are setting corporate water positive goals or something named like that um, and, and have programs in place to help achieve those goals. And generally, water stewardship programs uh, encompass all the efforts to reduce water use in their own operations and in their value chains, and, but as well as environmental water replenishment. And, and specifically in, in BF's work, and I think our, the nature of our conversation today, we're talking about water replenishment and restoration targets. These provide companies a, in a global metric that can be tracked and shared, measured against. Um, and, and quite specifically in this context, water replenishment means supporting projects and solutions that will deliver a volume of water to a local watershed and community over a designated period of time. Um, and I think a really good example of one of these, these targets, just as it's very clear, is a public one stated by Google. And Google states that Google will replenish more water than they consume by 2030 and support water security in communities where they operate. Um, and then the role of, of a group like VF is help them operationalize that and help them achieve those goals by supporting a variety of water projects across the globe. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. And just uh, to give like more information to our audience, um, when we talk about these kind of projects, a lot of people ask us uh, the question of why is a Google or a Intel working in this they is not that clear uh, why they uh, should be interested in corporate water stewardship. Maybe in a, a food and beverage company is uh, more easy to understand, but the, the tech companies is not uh, that that quite easy. No? Yeah, good question. Um, and I think that a lot of this work did start really with the food and beverage um, companies or even the consumer packaged good companies. Uh, but ultimately, every every company um, uses water, and every community uses water. And yeah. for tech companies in particular, um, there is in 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 traditional uh, data center and cooling towers. There's a lot of water consumed in um, the cooling of data centers, and uh, water consumed in our office building structures and um, throughout supply chains of various groups. So. Uh, it, Fortunately, it is one of the kind of environmental um, climate impact sustainability strategies that many companies are more engaged in. We're all a little bit more used to hearing about carbon and renewable energy yes, um, sure. and impacts. Uh, and, and water, fortunately, is um, is getting up to speed and getting up to pace with it as groups start to realize that there are, as water scarcity and water quality issues are just exacerbated because of climate impacts across the globe, many are thinking about long-term strategies, their impact on water, and their business risks, risks that are related to, will they have enough water to operate? And will there be enough water uh, for their their employees and their communities to um, customers to live where they are? Yeah, sure. And uh, and you mentioned uh, some point that uh, I want to to talk more about uh, why these, uh, these companies are investing in this, but Let's wait a little bit. And uh, I would like to uh, say to our audience that you can write your questions on our chat and uh, 20 minutes before uh, we finish our conversation, we're going to read all your, your questions. So uh, please ask us anything you want. 
And okay, sir, and and having that in mind, what what you said about uh, carbon and water, I think um, is is very important to put in the center of of the conversation water and also uh, agriculture. And uh, I like to bring uh, to the table that uh, one of the sample of this uh, was what happened last year at the, the COP28, the, the conference of, of, the, of the Paris from the United Nations, when uh, occurred for the first time that uh, they signed this uh, declaration of uh, sustainable agriculture, uh, resilient food systems and climate action. And with this, they elevated the importance of um, food systems to build a resilient climate futures for all, no? not just for a specific sector, but for all. And um, I don't want to, to talk a, a lot about this, but just to, to mention uh, a few key, key points that I think are available. They, uh, they talk about scaling up the uh, resilience um, and, uh, and adaptation, climate adaptation act activities of farmers, you know, through financial and technical support. Also, they talk about um, strengthening water management, and uh, another one was maximizing the climate and environmental benefits of restoration, conservation, and uh, protecting land and, and ecosystems. And in, 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 on that note, Sarah, uh, I would like to, to ask you how BEF uh, has experienced the um, the impact of agriculture in water or in water stewardship specific yeah absolutely Sorry, so um you know obviously there's the agriculture uh companies and supply chains themselves that are working very hard at bringing this out and committing to these goals and you know thinking in this corporate water stewardship action space um agriculture and agriculture based projects are a huge part of what we do. Um, as we all know, in many regions around the world, the agriculture industry is one of the largest users of fresh water. So naturally, it provides one of the greatest opportunities to help increase conservation efforts and stewardship engagements. Um, we have witnessed, um, both across North America and, and internationally, the projects that we can help facilitate that there are great opportunities to partner with agricultural communities and companies to help farmers use less water um, more efficiently and to kind of extend those benefits to the entire community and in particular the environment as well. Um, for some more specificity on that, I think many of the corporate water stewardship program projects that we have facilitated in funding will help incentivize farmers or ranchers to keep water in the rivers to pull less water um, from the rivers and designate them for environmental purposes and um, converting uh, crops to lower water use crops in some um, instances, uh, increasing irrigation efficiency practices, whether that's converting from flood irrigation to drip irrigation or lining of leaky canals, um, irrigation canals where water is leaking into the, the ground or evaporating before it is, gets, gets used. Um, and then to cases like using AI to optimize when and how to water, like our projects with Kalimo um, in the Mayapo Basin and other uh, locations. And um, I think the, the interesting thing with agriculture projects is that um, they're a really good fit where not only they have a, a significant impact that many people can understand, right? Of how we help yeah. the ag industry consume less water. Um, but they're also very measurable. And this is part of uh, we do, which I think we might talk about a little bit later on, but this concept of water replenishment is kind of built on this foundation of this vol volumetric benefit. Um, and this goes, I think, Carmen, a little bit back to the first question of like, why and how companies are participating. Um, because that through line isn't really clear on why a yes. tech company um, would be participating in it, Many of these companies have uh, 
establish these goals around this consideration of volume or storage, right? We use X amount of water in our operations. We're going to restore a similar amount of water to nature or conservation in some way. Um, so it's put this really tangible metric on it. But in order for that metric to be credible and there are goals and our claims to be credible, we need to um, evaluate and we need to measure and we need to report on the volume of water that is conserved and restored. Um, and agriculture uh, projects in particular provide a really clear methodology um, and measurement for, for capturing how much water was conserved um, in all of these practices. So they always are a, a huge part of the portfolio of projects funded um, really across every basin, uh, whether the, the basin's primary issue be water scarcity or even water quality. Yes, uh, thank you, Sarah. And I'm glad that you were uh, giving us these, these examples. Uh, it comes to my mind, uh, if you can, um, and since, since you have the experience, uh, can you uh, give us some uh, or mention examples of interventions from nature-based solutions to technology, not, of course, not only in agriculture, but in the whole spectrum of water stewardship? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's, it's a you know, constantly evolving field of work, right? And so when, when the work started, it, there was um, consideration of project types that had this very concrete, measurable understanding of water conserved or water restored. Um, and so a narrow, narrower set of projects that were being funded in earlier um, iterations of corporate water stewardship programs a lot of agriculture um, projects, a lot of what we would consider water leasing projects or flow restoration projects, which would be um, uh, those who have water rights that they can pull off of a river for groundwater, encouraging them or incentivizing them to keep them um, in the river for the full system benefit. And then as the, the industry has grown and the commitments have grown and um, companies and, and partners like us that are really focused on shared water challenges grow, the types and breadth of projects that are applicable in these programs are beginning to grow. And that's what we want to see. Uh, but just for the kind of list of project types, um, obviously we talked a lot about agriculture or uh, irrigation efficiency upgrades. Um, uh, there are a lot of habitat restoration or we call nature-based solution projects which is the, could be the restoration or protection of the healthy, a healthy wetland ecosystem um, mm -hmm. that is contributing to um, groundwater enhancement and, and water quality, um, pollution reduction, others. Um, could be benefits for recreational opportunities, right? Whether that is um, fishing, boating, skiing access. Um, we talk about in-stream flow, there's flint green infrastructure, right? And like stormwater capture, um, uh, tree planters and stuff that are both helping to, to capture, clean, slow the flow of water so that we can kind of capture it where we need it, when we need it. Soil conservation activities, no, also. Yeah, and conservation activities. Um, I think this is the, the area that getting more into too on like, how are we conserving in the urban space as well? So this will be uh, leak detection projects, either at the utility scale, and how are we detecting leaks in um, our uh, pipes, water utility pipes, that we could reduce those to as small as um, leaky toilets and, waters that, and a water that's leaking from toilet use, and how are we capturing and fixing those so that we are, uh, are conserving water that we're not really using. Um, mm -hmm. Water quality is a, a big piece too, both in stormwater management and also in agriculture practices, wastewater treatment, such. And then there's also the category, um, which many on the call may be familiar with, which is the wash category. So water mm -hmm. um, access, sanitation, and hygiene, and how are we supporting those, those sorts of projects as well. So many of them, and we keep hopefully adding more, right? Because there's a little bit of this project. Yes this project of water stewardship and that's trying to say okay 
how do we um, look at these projects, verify these projects so that they can be attributable to the objectives of the corporate partner so that we can address different types of water issues yes. um, based on shared water challenges and not just the projects that we know can have a volume and we can count them towards corporate goals. Yeah, sure. And and I think uh, it also, well, I guess uh, it also depends. Uh, it's not just like the corporate has this uh, volume target and maybe the year, but it's also important to know the um, the conditions of that uh, minor basin or the minor, or the major basin at what level uh, uh, the project should be deployed. Um, I don't know the, the the reality of of the place, right? Which kind of communities live live in there? Because it's not like you can do the same, for example, in the south of Mexico or in the border with Mexico and United States. Now that the, the realities are very different from nature and, and the people that live in there, right? Yeah, absolutely. To even the kind of logistical structures of funding projects, right? And what are permitting requirements in that area? And um, how, do the, how do we fund the projects and the organizations doing the work to advance the projects? And what does that timeline look like in scale? Um, so it's a very interesting, interesting element. M many of the corporations who have stated public goals and, and public replenishment goals have a 2030 sight line on, right? So we will restore X amount of water by 2030. And so the, the, the way that they're looking at this is an annual volume, and then a match annual volume. So supporting projects that are going to annually deliver a specific volume benefit in a region that by 2030, all of them are active and they're restoring their, hopefully their target volume of water. Um, but most of them have priority locations across the globe, right? So you're looking at a portfolio across the globe of all these different uh, priority basins and watersheds with mm -hmm. different shared water challenges, with different types of partners, different types of interventions, those at different stages of um, the industry where they are with this concept of, you know, corporations funding water projects. So a lot of what we do is um, kind of playing this middle maker or else this like matchmaker in aligning what the corporate goals are and the objectives with your point, Carmen, like the on the ground realities of what the issues are, who's providing the solutions, um, what kind of support do they need to get the projects implemented and um, and it's a little bit of a a, a dance to, to get everything yeah. along, right? From what they need and what they are and what is happening in, in, in that in that area, right? Yeah, correct. Correct. Yes. And Sarah, um Sarah, uh, we have been talking about um uh, like basics from water stewardship, uh what companies are doing different uh, types of interventions in, in water stewardship. Um, but I think uh, we should go uh, also to, to the place uh, maybe a few steps before, because uh, we were giving these examples from the companies that they already know uh, what they have to do, they already measure the water footprint, and it, uh, maybe they have these um, water stewardship leaders in the company as collaborators, but uh, for the companies that, uh, let's say, that they don't know how to start this path or how to join to these efforts, mm -hmm. uh, how they can join, how they can join these this efforts, not because uh, at, at the end, uh, all the companies, not just the, the big ones and the global companies uh, use water. You no, know? um, in, in, in Latin America, we have a lot of the local companies that are, are a big ones, but they don't really know how to uh, start this path. They already did this with with Caravan. They know what they what they need to do. They they have their their goals. But with water, I think um, 
there is information, but um, not that much as, as carbon. No? Uh, what do you recommend for, for these companies to, to join these efforts? Yeah, um, it's a great, great question, Carmen. And it's um, so a lot, a little bit of, of it is like making the case, right? Like why or how water stewardship in your company, and then um, how do you build out a program and operationalize the program? A little bit of it, and it, and I, um, I think you're right, and I, I would say even beyond just the business world, I think globally, um, unless you are impacted by the climate stressors day to day. Many people don't fully grasp the issues with fresh water. <laughs> yes. Uh, or where our water comes from or or all of it. Have we properly valued water? I don't think we have. And we are we are um we are hitting tipping points in cities now when we're approaching day zero for some cities with uh water access yeah. to um, all of the challenges that we're seeing across the globe from a water perspective. Um, and I think for water scarcity in particular, it's, society is right now placing value judgments on how we beneficially use something that is increasingly a limited resource. And between climate change and outdated policies and social values, it's making it hard for us to agree, agree on the economic, the social, or the environmental trade-offs when it comes to what is the beneficial use of water. Um, and I think one of our, our kind of greatest, um, challenges that we'll face and many businesses face is how do we prioritize the, how do we not prioritize like short-term economic gains at the expense of sustainable economic and community development systems, right? So this is taking the long-term approach of, um, concerns around water scarcity and understanding Okay, ultimately, will there be enough water to operate this business yes. in this basin? And will there be enough water for the people, the employees, the consumers, the um customers to like live comfortably in this and yes. prosper and support it? And so uh considering that, like as a as a business and considering um what are the business risks around growing water challenges and how can we develop a program to help combat that? And communicate that I think is a, is a key element. There's a lot of information out there um, for companies who have assessed their water risk through partners like the World Resources Institute and others, and then have developed programs to combat that. Um, but in addition to the, the real risks of water in the basin in which you need it in order to operate your business, we also talk a lot about the what we would consider, I'm sure there's other names for this, but the social license to operate or the reputational risk yes. in the region, right? Of even if it's just perception, if you're if you're citing a new um business in an in a region that is perceived to be a high water user and the community knows that they're already um scraping by from a water scarce perspective, how are those in the community are going to feel about the business coming in yes. And yes. using the water and the priority. And um, how does that as a company prioritize um, just as you would, you know, now we're seeing it with renewable energy and carbon when they're citing new places, mm -hmm. how do we prioritize water and water to the benefit of the community as part of um, siting and development plans uh, so that we are viewed as like a responsible um, user of the resources and in, in the community. Um, you know, I think we're also at an interesting next time where a lot of the, the goals and objectives were developed around this concept of volumetric water in order to, to have a metric that many people could use in their companies to get it up the executive chain, right? And say, mm -hmm. here's a clear metric. We use this water. We want to restore this water. Let's build a budget after it. That is a one, and it can be a very narrow metric, and it can be a limited yes. metric when it comes to the kind of water impact we want to have. So I would encourage groups now that are, are either um, looking at rewriting their water targets or objectives or writing new ones, that um, there's a lot of consideration for what kind of impact is needed from a water perspective, and how do we write goals that are allow flexibility in the kinds of solutions that we can invest in to achieve them. 
Um, and there's a lot of great resources and coalitions out there. There's the uh, CEO Water Mandate and the Water Resources mm -hmm. Coalition that is helping companies um, look at their impact and come together to think about solutions and basins. Um, the World Resources Institute, a lot of this work. So I think there's places that we can point some people Water Mandate that um, would be beneficial, but uh, I I'm hoping that everyone is more forward looking in their programmatic approaches in this, that will allow us to kind of address more concerns and not be too pinned by this concept of water replenishment or volume um, moving forward. Yes, and and I think actually um, uh, a lot of of um, organizations that are working in this, I think. Um, they are not feel very comfortable using uh, uh, the the term of replenishment because of yeah. what you say. No, uh, maybe uh, it can it it can sound like it's just a transaction uh, transaction that uh, you took water from a basin and um, you replenish that water. No, and and it, it's it's not just like that. No, and it it needs not to be like like that. And and also, Sarah, uh, you have been mentioning the this uh, guide. Um, uh, I think not a lot of of people, and maybe it's the same in our audience. They don't they don't know this guide. And talking uh, again about carbon, uh, there's a a lot of information uh, exists. This. Um, uh, auditors for for the carbon projects and in the water projects uh, exists for water projects is this this guide uh, the name is the volumetric water benefit accounting for uh, for the for our audience to, to know and this guide is uh, well is an international guide that was developed by the World Resources Institute. And is uh, very helpful, as Sarah, uh, Sarah said, to measure, uh, monitor, and report with all the, the transparency of the data that have been um, that has been generated uh, with the project. And with this, uh, with this kind of reports based on the uh, development of water benefit accounting guide. Um, these projects can be validated you know, for, for uh, by a third party, but uh, as you as you said, Sarah, is 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 not. Um, of course, we need to implement the projects based in that in this guide, but it's important to go uh, to impact beyond that. You no, know, to impact the communities. Uh, to put in in the center of of the project, the key stakeholders build um, territory with them for the for the success and long term of of the project. So, um, Sarah, if if you want to to talk a little bit about this guide and uh, how is like. Um, it's like uh, I don't know, like uh, I don't know how to say, like a connected uh, process using this guide, but also uh, since the the beginning of the project, start building this uh, this relationship with the key, st key stakeholders, no, which uh, can be or are the most um, common stakeholders in the water stewardship projects. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Carmen. It's um, we, we'll know that this environmental water stewardship or replenishment or restoration is completely voluntary at this point, right? And yeah, um, and that's very Sarah. That's very important to say. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. Just uh, the last week, um, uh, uh, some people ask us this question that. Why the companies do this uh, if there is not like a policy or if there is a policy that they need to accomplish? But no, yeah, I think it, it's great that you that you bring that to the table. Right. And there are plenty of that. Right. There's regulatory elements. Um, 
I'm I'm less familiar with all the regulatory elements in international locations, but in places like the U.S., if you site something and you take up some wetland area, you need to restore wetland in another area. There are things in place that kind of companies need to do from a regulatory standpoint uh, related to water um, or on their on their uh, operational sites. This is a bit of a different category, right? And it's still it's voluntary. Um, and I'll note that the these these things like the volumetric water benefit accounting protocols and others exist too because we understand that there is greater and greater scrutiny around sustainability claims being made by companies, right? So this is coming out of how do you substantiate these claims and make sure and how do we as um, uh, groups outside of the company make sure that what people are saying they're doing is actually happening. And that's a really yeah. important thing that we want to make sure happens. Um, but the the volumetric water benefit accounting protocol is, as you said, it's a guideline for those. If you do have a volumetric goal target claim you want to make, here are some better practices for um, standardizing uh, companies for helping standardize companies for reporting the benefits tracking and measuring those projects, reporting the benefits of those projects, um, and ensuring kind of guardrails to make sure that the, the claims that are being made are credible. Again, it's guidelines, and it's a helpful way to look at what um, types of projects to consider and kind of what projects would be in, what projects would, would be out, um, how you look around claims and communication on those projects how you track and report um, annually on those projects and, and how that gets rolled up into a communication effort. Um, these were released early, I think 2019 was the first one, and they're currently um, uh, under a rewrite. BEF is fortunately a part of that project team that's looking at the VWBA 2.0, which is built around um, things that have been learned in the past couple of yes. years funding these projects. There's a lot of, sorry, Sarah, a lot of information about the claims now because also there is uh, a lot of doubts uh, about uh, how to make the claims, who can make the claims, uh, if it totally. depends in, in, the, in the investment that they are doing, if it's, uh, if it's a co-inversion, there's a lot of doubts around. Yeah. Uh, Claims also right and yeah and like right, what method methodology should be used per project type to consider volume right and one of the things that we talk a lot about on, on our team is that the conservation organizations or agencies or local governments or water um, districts who am, whomever is implementing projects isn't implementing their project for an output of a volumetric benefit for a corporate claim, right? They're implementing their projects for um, various other impact, whether it's um, biodiversity or habitat or um, uh, a variety of other things. Um, Social KPIs. And yeah, yeah, and so we're kind of translating the outputs of the projects into this consideration of this volumetric benefit. So the protocols help guide um, companies or practitioners in in doing that. Um, again, it's voluntary and it's designed to be a guide because companies are going to write their programs. They're going to make different decisions on um, how they assess projects. Um, they may look at the scale of a, um, a watershed basin differently, depending on on where their operations are. But it's provided to be guidance and, and trying to streamline it across the industry. Um, but but to your point is, you know, given the scope of the water challenges that we face across the globe, we're yes. hoping to add some new tell, new and detailed guidance around how do we incentivize companies towards more transformational solutions um, that enable additional benefits or catalyze new opportunities. And essentially, how do we help companies get credit for um, funding wow. early really projects? Great. Or being in the community, and it's all under discussion, right? It's, it's the the kind of neat thing, but also a vexing thing about a voluntary product where it's like, well, don't yeah, really we'll, know. we'll be waiting for that for that uh, new recommendations. Yeah, yeah. 
And Sarah, so uh, about all this uh, that we have been talking, I like to highlight the importance of the effective uh, water management because um, uh, it may sound like water stewardship is uh, just an environmental issue, but as you said, is also um, a, a business issue, you know, a, a business imperative. Since um, when companies, government, uh, uh, and in general, if we talk about water uh, governance, uh, when we have a, when there is a good or efficient water management, this uh, will lead to mitigate financial, operational uh, risk, and also uh, enhance the long-term viability of, of the business, right? And um, uh, with this on, on mind, I, I'd like to, to ask my, my last question, uh, to have time to, to read the, the question from our audience. Um, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask you uh, if you can explain us the difference between um, investing in the owns company supply chain for, for water efficiency and the difference of investing in uh, replenishment, because uh, we have seen that uh, also there is there is a lot of confusion with with these two kind of interventions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, um, you know, we would surmise that in order to address water security, water resiliency issues. Um, across the globe, in particular in water scarce areas, we really need to the two parts of the equation, right? We need yes. to reduce the water we use um, both at the individual level, but at the you know at the corporate level in operations, in supply chains, um, in their value chains, we need to conserve water in the things. And then the other part of the equation is we need to restore water to nature and and to communities and to have the water where we need it, when we need it for the benefit of more people for a longer period of time. And so that first part of the equation is really the, um, maybe the onsite, the, you know, within the fence line, within the four walls, even within the supply chain. Um, you know, I think the same conversations are happening in water as we're in carbon of like whose responsibility is what mm -hmm. as you go up the, up the supply chain or up the value chain. But, um, that's one part of it, right, of, of conserving in the operations and in the in the side. Um, and then the part that we spent most of the time talking about today is how how are we moving beyond the fence line and how are companies looking at um, restoring water for the benefit of the whole system and for the benefit of mm -hmm. all the people. And that does include, um, you know, we, we used to joke that people would be like, okay, so are you taking water out of one area and dumping it into another? Um, it's not that some projects may move some water around, but the the portfolio of projects that can be included in outside of the the company's supplier value chain do consider conservation, right? They could be conserving for the municipal water supply, um, but then in many places they're also just restoring it to nature. And we're looking at how do we benefit all of it? How do we benefit businesses? How do we benefit communities? How do we benefit species? How do we benefit the environment? Um, and that's what the second part of the equation is, right? Of like looking at water resiliency and we can only achieve water resiliency if we have clean, reliable water for all people and all communities. Yes. And all species. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And because it, it's, it, I think it's very easy because uh, even though you're uh, efficient, being efficient, uh, efficient, sorry, in your own facility. If the origin of the water, the like the basin, uh, is running out of water, uh, it doesn't matter how much you're being efficient inside yeah. of your facility. You know, if there is no water outside, you know, exactly the origin. 
Okay, exactly. so um, let's go and uh, read the questions. Uh, William Lozano said, uh, do water stewardship alliances have standards and methods to verify if companies are complying with their self-imposed promises? Um, I think I'm going to... Yeah. You can see them also in the in the chat. Are you working down or up? Mm -hmm. Um. So yes, yeah, so I think that the the volumetric water benefit accounting protocols and those help. Um. You know, is there currently well, and there's a lot of partners that exist in the space that are helping the corporate partners, right? So they have their funding. They Many of them have third-party organizations that are um, are kind of validating the methodology used for the the volume calculations, um, and then there are groups that are getting reporting, right? So just ensuring that the projects are implemented, they're happening as designed. And ultimately, that the the water benefit is occurring in the time that it's it's occurring. Um, there's not one particular kind of a watchdog group that is assessing everybody, every company's claims and their achievement to it. But a lot of the companies right now are um, do have audits in place on their own um, accord that is ensuring that what they're saying they're investing in is happening and all of the substantiation is needed to to be there and whether that is um an, an independent um audit that's happening by uh, an accounting protocol firm or through their ESG programs those are starting to happen more and more uh that are ensuring that what the companies are saying that they're doing and the claims that they're making are in fact happening yes Yes. And and I think too, even to mention in the, the VW um VA work, also the CEO water mandate work, there's a lot of peer-to-peer -peer connection, right? So the the those in the companies who are tasked with this or overseeing the water um stewardship programs want them to be credible programs and they're working with their peers and other corporates to ensure that um the industry is kind of working as they would like to see it, right? Because one bad actor and it could have an impact about the credibility of other companies programs as well yes. so there's a little like peer-to-peer -peer engagement and pressure if you will to um, ensure that there's substantiated programs in place yes yes of course and and i think um uh, make these uh these statements like uh, that they will, these companies will replenish every drop of, of water that they use. It's, uh, it's a big commitment. Uh, mm -hmm. If they are not going to accomplish this, uh, uh, they will they will not be uh, saying this in public. Now they are yeah. saying this because it, there's a lot of work before they they made this, this public, no? Um, and they know if they they are not accomplished this, they, they will be in problems. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, Malka Malka Gijon, she she said one solution to create a sustainable agriculture is using treated water wastewater to irrigate, which has multiple benefits. Have you considered this option for the projects? Um, yeah. Um. And I can't, I unfortunately I can't speak to a lot of the, the technical elements of all the projects that are happening across the globe. Um, some of that is dependent on uh, policies, regional policies and the ability to use treated wastewater um, for mm -hmm. it. But I do know that that is happening in many um, locations and some of the projects that are being funded are um, including that of, of how you using treated wastewater for, um, uh, for agriculture use also treated wastewater to be used for um, watering in, in certain areas too. So you're not drawing fresh water for watering of a golf course or um, yes. watering the landscape and how you can use um, treated wastewater to do that. So it is being considered, um, there are organizations doing that, I think dependent upon 
the local policies, yeah. in areas, um, but definitely part of the, the solution set. Great. Uh, Rodrigo Fernandez, uh, what's your take on rainwater harvesting? Is it really a solution worth implementing in, for example, rural communities? What impacts could we expect on this kind of systems? If we're looking at rain patterns changing because of climate change. Yeah, um, Rodrigo, great question. Um, again, probably a little beyond my my comfort level in speaking to um, at mm -hmm. the global level. I I do think it has been an implemented solution for a lot of um, areas uh, need that could you could use it. But your point on um, changing rainwater patterns is hard, right? So is it a sustainable solution for um, a lot of locations? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, they have, I can say that some rainwater harvesting programs have been part of corporate water stewardship programs in the past where they make good sense. And all of it is led by the community space, right? So if there's shared, um, uh, shared water challenges and shared goals and directives of community organizations working towards um, implementing water solutions to the plan. And if that's part of one that they think is part of the solution, then we think it's a valuable uh, valuable engagement to do it. Um, can I say that it, I, I, I don't know if it's, if I would say it's, it is or not worth implementing in areas yeah. that it's really dependent on, on the place. Now, the other thing is, um, yeah, changing, um, rain patterns and climate change can shift, but what what could be done today to get the water where we need it today is also a meaningful solution that might need to change five years from now or ten years from now. We need to look at different solutions in the areas. Yes, sure. And and as you said, Sarah, I think we we cannot see the solutions like these are the solutions globally. No, uh, we need yeah, to go totally. case by case. No, as we said, know the reality, know the community, how's the ecosystem, and um, and based on that, uh, the the solution need needs to to be designed. Yeah. And uh, um, and with that question of Rodrigo, uh, I would like to to give an example here in Mexico City. Uh, as as you know, we having uh, having a lot of uh, problems with with water now. With water stress, but uh, we have a, a long um, uh, rain season. No, so uh, here in some in some areas, there's these uh, rainwater ha harvesting schools from mm -hmm. rural communities, and uh, for for those schools in that uh, in those communities, is a valuable solution no? since they they don't have uh, um, a good access to water. You know? So, <clears throat> yeah, in, in that case, it's a good solution. And because we have a, a, a good a rain season, if we are, for example, in, this, in the north of Mexico or in the south of, of the United States, Arizona, where the rain uh, is not, you have a, a, a very short rain season, I think it's not uh, the, the best solution, no? because you don't have a lot of, of rain in there. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think, and I mean, that illustrates like a, a really good point with um, with water from, from the programs. The primary difference between carbon and water is that water is local, right? So you can't say you have a program that um, you're operating in the Mayapo Basin in um, La Diago and you have a program in the United States and say, oh, we're, you know, water neutral because we're, we're, we're no. storing water. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess you could, you'd probably, you'd probably get <laughs> some scrutiny for that, but the impact is, is a local base, right? Um, and we think a lot of the water projects is one of our biggest challenges is we have, um, we have created communities and industries that we have moved water from its natural location and piped it and moved it around that we oftentimes don't have the water where we need it when we need it most. And so um, how are we creating solutions that are 
are allowing for the collection of water, the cleaning of water, whether that's a natural solution, um, like a nature-based solution or rainwater harvesting or others so that we we capture the water from runoff. Um, we have water where we need it, when we need it. We're using it at its optimal source. Um, and it's going to be a lot of different solutions. Um, and we would never advise a company to create some kind of program where they're going to say, this is our program, and we're going to implement it the same way every location. Um, yes. It doesn't work that way. Yes. And I think uh, we're almost... Uh run of time. So um, there is uh, one last question. It's in Spanish, but I'm, I'm going to translate it for, for you, Sarah. Uh, Alejandro Alexis said, uh, thanks. This question is for Sarah. I would like to uh, see uh, some opportunities to keep uh, contributing to conservation um the conservation of um, some forests alejandro is saying that uh he's in charge of the man the proper management of a five thousand hectares of mm -hmm. native forest in chile so uh he would like to explore opportunities from uh, outside of chile to uh keep uh conserving this this forest and yeah. I'm sorry, sir, before you answer, uh, Alejandro, there's uh, this uh, organization that is called Acción Andina. They are doing a great work there. Over there, maybe you, you can contact them. I, I'll give you the, the website. And if you want the... The direct con contact you can write to to Kilimo, and I don't know if you want to to say something about about that, Sarah. Also, just to note that I think forest, um, forest restoration, uh, forest health and maintenance projects, um, fire risk reduction, uh, all of that has volumetric benefit, and as I think this is noting that. Um, there is the the capture and filtration of, of water um, associated with uh, sustainable forest management health. We have um, funded, uh, supported the, the funding of a number of those types of projects in the United States and um, would be eager to look at similar projects um, in other other parts of the country. Um, and if near Santiago, the Mayapo Basin, it is a key water uh, priority area of um, a number of corporate partners. And um, I'd be happy to share my email if we'd like to discuss uh, opportunities like that more. Okay. Actually. So uh, thank you very much. I think we are run of time. Uh, somebody asked me to write my email. I'm gonna write it down. Uh, there you have my my email and um, share, so, I can share mine as well yeah, too. You, yeah. you can share your email too Sarah yeah okay so um thank you very much Sarah for for your for your time uh, it was great uh, having this this conversation our second uh, webinar in English yes <laughs> Thank you uh, for the opportunity to deliver this in English. No, thank you. Um, yeah, because we're not native speakers, so thank you for your patience. <laughs> and yeah, uh, please uh, keep joining us uh, for our word talks and see you soon. Have a nice day, everyone. You too, Sarah. Yeah, thank you, Carmen. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye.